I want to start by welcoming you to the Berkeley EECS Annual Research Symposium, BEARS. I'm David Culler, currently chair of EECS. And the first thing I'd like to do uh, as we talk about this very interesting year is to introduce you to our newest chair, uh, Sujay King Liu, um, Associate Chair of EECS and Chair of EE. Good morning and wel welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you and I hope you enjoy your day. We have an exciting program for you. So Sujay and I are going to spend uh, maybe three minutes telling you just a tiny bit of the exciting year uh, we've had since we saw you last. And uh, in the meantime, people will be trickling in. So you may remember last year the theme of the conference was uh, Berkeley does big data in a big way. We had some fabulous talks. What we couldn't say to you at that but knew was that uh, Berkeley Amp Lab had been awarded the NSF uh, expeditions. Uh, that's the algorithms, machines, and people. The reason we couldn't say a word was because in March, the White House was announcing the National Big Data Initiative. And of course, at that, uh, our colleagues up at DOE won the, the large DOE uh, grant, and uh, the AMP Lab went on to win the DARPA X data, really building the foundations, if you will, the BSD for big data. So um, we were, uh, all of that was uh, still embargoed, but um, for a multi-agency initiative, um, all of the agencies are investing here in Berkeley, we think quite wisely. Uh, beyond that, uh, another really important development. Whoops, I guess I left those off. Okay, so in recent years, uh, and demand for our CS courses has, has surged, but this year, interestingly, we've seen a resurgence of demand in our hardware uh, courses. And so I'm, we're pleased to announce that Texas Instruments uh, gave us a very generous gift to allow us to remodel the undergraduate electronics design lab. This semester, over fi almost 500 students are actually using this lab, so the timing is really, really good. The grand opening will be in April. Um, so TI, has, uh, has, with this generous gift, has allowed us to remodel not only the lab downstairs, but also the overlying student lounge and a maker lab space. And these spaces will be connected by an open stairwell to facilitate traffic flow. The grand opening is scheduled for April 11th, uh, so that's uh, very soon. And also, Agilent Technologies has generously donated instrumentation for the students, a brand new instru instrumentation for the students to use in this lab. So the other thing we were on pins and needles about was we were locked in a two-year-long competition nationwide for the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. This was a pretty big deal, $60 million over 10 years. Uh, the university came through with a building, so it's really more like $100 million, and needless to say, we won. So uh, our view going in was uh, the winner would lead uh, theoretical computer science for the next 20, 25 years. And, uh, we thought that was true regardless, and um, we're happy to be in the winning seat. Uh, so you'll hear more about that today from Dick Karp later on in the session. Uh, but if you hadn't noticed, the world of education has completely changed around us. So this was another huge development. Uh, there was quite a bit of buzz last year about the $100 million that Berkeley, that MIT and Harvard had each put into edX. So uh, after a lot of discussion and the EECS faculty driving forward from the bottom up in all kinds of directions, we decided to align with that joined edX, so we lead the external consortium, and uh, a third of the, com of the classes and the core technology is part of the open source uh, Berkeley development. And in addition, uh, we started developing uh, programs uh, that uh, really rely on this technology, and Sujay may want to say a word on that. So we also want to announce that starting in the fall, we will be offering a fully online professional master's uh, degree program in the specializing in integrated circuits. Um, so you should see that on our website if you're interested. And if you were wondering how we were doing in hiring through the downturn when we had no slots, uh, the picture looks like this. And uh, so just imagine what we're going to do now that uh, the economy has turned around and we have room to grow. Speaking of growing, uh, 
We are now at about 50% above the peak in student demand. And uh, no matter what dimension you look like, it's growing, it's still inflected up. Uh, what you see in there is an opening computer science course of 750 people. And at least in Soda Hall, what you see is a lot of undergrads sitting on the floor. So there's a lot we can do to provide a better experience. Um, and of course, what we've shown you here is just the tip of the iceberg. You'll get lots more through the uh, afternoon sessions with the open houses and whatnot. So with that, uh, it's our great pleasure to introduce this year's distinguished alumni. And first. Okay, I think uh, Nick McEwen unfortunately is ill, and so he's at home today, but I should uh, at least say a few words. He's a professor of computer science and electrical engineering at Stanford University. He received his PhD here in 1995 under the, the supervision of Professor Jean Walrand. Um, he's actually founded uh, many successful companies. Um, to save time, I'll just mention he's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. He's a fellow of the United Kingdom's Royal Academy of en Engineering. He's been given many awards, the most recently the ACM SIGCOM Lifetime Achievement Award. And the uh, citation for Nick is for his fund, uh, so he's receiving the Outstanding Alumni Award in Electrical Engineering this year for his fundamental contributions to router design and software-defined networking. So we will have to find another occasion to congratulate Nick. So with all that, Nick has the good sense. Um, he's homesick with his family, so we'll uh, appreciate him uh, virtually. Uh, and on the CS side, it's my pleasure to announce the uh, one of the two Distinguished Alumni Awards to Cecilia Aragon uh, for fundamental contributions to search tree data structures and collaborative scientific computing, and as an inspiring role model as both a computer scientist and a world-class acrobatic pilot. So let me say just a word. So she did her PhD here uh, with Marty Hurst, uh, but also worked with Raymond Sedell, a former Berkeley faculty member developing the TREEP data structure, went on to be a terrific professor at the University of Washington, and on the side represented uh, the U.S. nationally in various acrobatic. Uh, so we have uh, something approximating your certificate, since you're actually here in person. Please come on up. Well, I hadn't planned on anything, but um, I just want to say I'm really honored, truly honored and humbled and very grateful to receive this award. It's, it's thrilling to be back in Berkeley. I've had a wonderful um, time talking with people again and seeing the beautiful weather. You have it sunny and not raining like it is in Seattle all the time. Um, and uh, so thank you very much. Okay, the, the next, the second uh, winner of the Outstanding Alumni Award in Electrical Engineering goes to Mr. Sanjay Marotra. I'd like to invite him up here for groundbreaking contributions in flash memory innovation and commercialization that have changed the world for the better. So, uh, let me just say a few words. Maybe if David could give him a shoot. So Sanjay, uh, Mr. Marotra is a co-founder and president and CEO of SanDisk Corporation. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees here at UC Berkeley, and his uh, research advisor was Professor Bill Oldham. He has o over 30 years of experience in the semiconductor memory industry. He's worked for a number of uh, companies uh, before SanDisk, uh, Atmel, Intel, and Integrated Device Technology. And in 2006, he and his co-founders of SanDisk won a major IEEE award for the Storage Device Technology Award. And he currently serves uh, on the board of directors for KVM Networks, and he's also a member of our college's um, ad advisory board. So congratulations, Sanjay, and thank you for your contributions. Thank you. you know, I just wanted to say that I am humbled and deeply thankful to the department for this recognition. And whatever I have achieved, I always say that really I owe it to the solid foundation and education that I got here at Berkeley. 
And even this, to this day, 33 years later, many times I find the fundamentals I learned here as an undergraduate and a graduate student in EECS uh, helped me in uh, making decisions and advancing our technology today. So it's been a wonderful experience and quite an honor to be here today. And even to this day, I believe that Berkeley provides the best education that is out there. And for us at Sandus, the best proof of that is that maximum graduates that we hire every year from any university tend to be from Cal and mostly from, from EECS. So I'm very thankful uh, for what the professors and the staff here are doing at UC Berkeley day in, day out. I, I really uh, thank them for the wonderful work that's being done at Berkeley. Thank you. So our uh, final distinguished alumni uh, this year is Eric Allman. For contributions to Berkeley Unix, open source software, and particularly SendMail, uh, the underlying infrastructure upon which the, electronic, the world's electronic mail depends, I think it's fair to say without, without Eric, we may not have email as we know it today. So I'll just say, uh, Eric, of course, is a local, uh, grew up here and uh, played with the, back to the IBM 1401, he's uh, that kind of a youngster, uh, did his bachelor's and master's here, and so many other things uh, before he went out into the real world for a period of time. So we're always glad to have him back. Thank you. So I uh, consider myself to be more lucky than, than smart. Uh, I came to an absolutely extraordinary place at an extraordinary time. Uh, Unix was just coming in, and we were one of the first places outside of Bell Labs that had it. And that has formulated my career in ways that I could not possibly have predicted. Uh, Berkeley's just kind of the kind of place where things like that happen. So, uh, and I'm deeply honored to achieve this, but I do want to point out that I may have invented some piece of email, but spam's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, on behalf of the department and to all four of our distinguished alumni, what we'd like to say to you for your terrific work and your support of, of the institution and the department. So we'd like to say to you, thanks. So with that, uh, Dave Patterson, our chair for EECS, never thought we'd get here on time, despite our late start, and here we are. So uh, it's my pleasure to kick off the morning session and uh, if we can switch over to our first speaker. <clears throat> and your machine is right there. So uh, our first of speakers who need no introduction, but I'll cover airtime while he gets set, is uh, Edward Lee. Uh, many of you will recognize from the days when uh, he was chair leading this particular activity. And uh, of course, he's been working for uh, many years in the area of embedded systems, and in particular uh, in bringing uh, sound software techniques to the embedded space. And uh, he's going to talk to you about a new project tied in with the Swarms lab that you heard about in last year's Bears, uh, which is now launched off to an exciting and quite deep research agenda. Edward, thank you. And I'll play Iron Fist to keep us on time. Okay, thank you, David. Um, so um, the project that I'm going to tell you about is exactly one month old, uh, officially, uh, launched January 15th. Uh, we call it the TerraSwarm Research Center. Um, it's a $28 million over five-year project involving nine universities, extremely ambitious in scope. Um, but as with a lot of these projects, the vision of this effort is uh, not something that is only a month old. It's something that has incubated, that we've incubated over some time and have developed. And so what I'd like to try to do is convey to you what the, what the vision of this effort is. Um, so 
the term swarm uh, is not one that actually um, we originated with this project. It's a term that people are using to uh, refer to the millions of devices that are uh, interacting directly with the physical world uh, and are becoming networked. So these are the sensors and actuators all around us, for example, in the HVAC systems in buildings uh, or, in, uh, or in surveillance systems for security and so on. Um, so this project is focused on that swarm technology. Now, uh, the backdrop of this, of course, is, is information technology. And, and the distinction that I'd like to make here is that whereas information technology is primarily about uh, uh, processing information for, for human consumption, um, this project is really much more focused on the interaction between that cyber world of information technology and the physical world around us. So it, it has to do with uh, basically giving this cyber world eyes, ears, hands, and feet so that it interacts directly uh, with the physical environment around us. Now, one of the insights that led to the incubation of this technology was actually a misunderstanding that many of us had uh, about the emergence of cloud technology. So I, I was certainly one of the people who kind of uh, misunderstood the primary benefits of this. So it, you know, one of the clear benefits of, of this technology, of course, is the cost savings you get from the aggregation of your resources and the consolidation in you know, a, centralized, uh, ma a centrally managed uh, uh, facility where you get economies of scale. And of course, you're taking advantage of networking and virtualization in order to create the illusion that people have their own data centers. Um, but you do this at a considerably lower cost than it would take them to, to, um, to in fact have their own data center. So this cost savings is clearly one of the, one of the motivations. But in my opinion, this is not the biggest impact that the cloud has had. The cost savings is clearly an impact, but it's not the biggest impact. The biggest impact uh, was a, a little bit unexpected to many of us, and it's, I think it's manifested most clearly in the emergence of, um, of social networks. And in, in, this, in, this, uh, in, in social networks, the, the value uh, that the cloud provide, provides is primarily in the ability to aggregate data from a multiplicity of sources. Okay, you get data coming in from all over the place, and it's that ability to pull this data together to in, and then to extract it, uh, actionable information from that aggregation of data. That is an enormous value that you can't get from a more decentralized approach to computing. The, one of the key visions in this TerraSwarm Research Center is that we see the same thing happening in this cyber and physical interaction, where as soon as you get the, you, you get the capability of aggregating data from a, from a huge multiplicity of sources, sensor, sensor information from millions of sensors around us, and the ability to then take action in the physical world, that through that aggregation of data, we can tremendously increase the power of what we can do with, uh, with, by leveraging computing to make the world a physical, uh, uh, the physical world a better place. So, you know, imagine vastly improved transportation systems, enormously improved uh, energy efficiency and things like that. Okay, so today's big thing, of course, is what we call the 20 year overnight revolution of the wireless handheld device. Uh, why 20 years? Well, because uh, uh, actually 21 years ago, uh, Bob Broderson and Jan Rabai launched the InfoPad project. And here's a couple of uh, uh, Bob Broderson's slides from a keynote that he gave at the conclusion of that project in 1997, where at that time they had a working InfoPad, a picture of which you can kind of see here, and a, and a vision of this thing operating in very much the same way that uh, I see several iPads in the room and uh, tablets out there are operating today. So when Apple introduced the iPad uh, in, in Corey Hall, we referred to it as InfoPad 2.0. Um, so it, this is, of course, consistent with the Berkeley style. Uh, we do these big projects that are meant to be very visionary and uh, by design are meant to be 20 years ahead of, um, of what you're going to see in the real world, and that certainly manifested itself in this case. 
So what's happening today, of course, is that these mobiles are um, providing the interface between the cloud and us humans, okay? They give us the portal into that, into that information technology world. And we're seeing, of course, enormous growth, so there's a lot of industrial interest in this. But, um, of course, we're trying to think 20 years ahead, so we're thinking about the next big thing, which we refer to as the swarm at the edge of the cloud. Okay, so these are the devices that are going to interact rather than primarily uh, with humans, rather than providing a portal into the information world for humans, they provide the interaction between that information world and our physical environment. That's what we call the swarm at the edge of the cloud. Now, um, in some ways, this is also not a completely new vision, right? In fact, um, uh, Chris Peaster, uh, coined the term smart dust and started you know, proposing wireless, wirelessly networked uh, tiny sensor devices uh, that were going to be, become hugely pervasive. And around 19, uh, sorry, around 2005, um, people were enormously optimistic about the potential growth of this. And here's an actual, uh, actual data from a projection that in 2005, this projection estimated that the world market for sensors would be around $10.3 uh, billion, and that half of that would be wireless sensor networks. Now, of course, this was a 2005 prediction, and what actually happened in, in 2010 was that the wireless sensor network was only about $500 million instead of, you know, basically a factor of 10, uh, an order of magnitude short of what the projections uh, were for this technology. There's many potential interpretations for why this fell so drastically short of the optimism that people had. Uh, but our opinion is that the key obstacle was the closed nature of these wireless sensor network systems, that they were, where they were getting deployed, they were getting deployed in proprietary ways to form part of a, of a closed design of an HVAC system or a security system, for example, and that the inability to access the resources provided by these components in these wireless sensor network systems was the principal obstacle to innovation that would lead to the benefit that you get from networking these devices. So again, thinking back about the transformation in social networks, it's the aggregation of data from a multiplicity of sources that gives you the multiplying factor that you can get from having very large numbers of these things. So what we have to do, and again, this is so consistent with the Berkeley philosophy, is we have to open up the APIs to these things. We have to make them, in fact, accessible so that our goal in the TerraSwarm project is to unleash millions of creative app developers and give them access to swarm technology, okay? Now, obviously, this is a daunting problem. There's enormous security concerns, right? If you open up the APIs to, to devices that control our physical world, um, tremendous risks uh, around that. Uh, if you open up uh, the APIs to devices that are able to do extensive sensing around us, obviously, tremendous risks uh, to our privacy and our security. So this is not an easy problem, um, but we believe that if we can solve this problem, we will make an enormous impact because we will enable this, this multiplying factor of this aggregation of data from, from multiplicity of sources and start to be able to leverage the, the benefits that we get uh, from having very large numbers of these devices. So when we set out to define a research project around this, um, we realized that this was something that no, um, none of us were sufficiently expert in the breadth of topics uh, that we needed. And so we, 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 we organized this project in a little bit of an unconventional way. You know, academics often, when they, st when they want to start out a research project, they talk to a few of their buddies, the people they know the best. They form a little team, and they form a proposal. Uh, we started that way with a sort of small core group of people, but started with a primary focus on what this core group of people that we were didn't know rather than what we did know. And then we set out to recruit the best brains in the areas that we didn't know uh, to have that covered. So the team that we ended up with is, uh, I think, quite uh, an awesome team. So we've got, for example, three of the world's best control systems people. Um, 
Uh, Vijay Kumar is actually now uh, um, spending most of his time in the White House as an advisor uh, there, but he has done, if you haven't seen his TED talk or videos of his uh, um, uh, swarms of, uh, of autonomous aircraft, uh, I really recommend taking a look at these. These are quite awesome. Uh, George Pappas has been uh, extremely innovative in applying control systems technology to security problems. So that, to me, when I heard, first heard about that, I said, wait, hold it, disconnect. Uh, how do you apply control theory to uh, security problems? It turns out to be an extremely good match, and I think George is the first person who really recognized this and was able to demonstrate this. Um, we have a, a number of very skilled systems architects, like uh, Kubi and Anthony Rowe at CMU, John Wozniak, we have people who are extremely creative in the application space. Uh, David Wessel is a, uh, he's actually on our faculty in the music department, and he runs the Center for New Music and Audio Technology, and tomorrow afternoon they're having an open house there where they're demonstrating interactive participatory music creation using swarms of networks, uh, swarms of sensors that are reacting to the public who will be walking around in this space. That's happening uh, in, on uh, Holy Hill uh, tomorrow, I think, uh, between 10 and 3. So I recommend stopping by if you're around. It should be quite, quite an impressive operation. Um, we also have some of the very best people in, um, in uh, machine learning. Uh, Carlos Guestrin. Uh, is a uh, creator of, again, following, he's very much in, although he's not a Berkeley guy, he's at uh, the University of Washington, he's very aligned with the Berkeley spirit of open source and open architectures, and he has been uh, building over many years uh, an open source toolkit uh, enabling people to leverage uh, large-scale machine learning algorithms uh, without having to develop these algorithms from scratch. Um, so that's just a few of the people. So we've got also people who are very expert in the wireless sensor network uh, area, like uh, David Blau, and people who are experts in security. Kevin Fu is one of the people who has been really at the forefront of security for, for uh, medical uh, technology, where privacy is a pro uh, prominent uh, concern. And we're also collaborating with the Intel Science and Technology Center, which is headquartered here at Berkeley and is focused on security. So they're working very closely with us on this effort. So it's really quite an amazing team that we've got together, and I'm, I'm just absolutely thrilled to be working with these people. Uh, there is some structure, of course, but we can skip over that. So what I'd, what I'd like to do is focus on what, uh, how we've kind of organized intellectually the topics in, in here. So the, the project is organized around four themes. The, so the, the application theme is a theme around smart cities. Um, then we have a theme on platform architectures, and, and I'll, I'll come back to the smart cities, but I just want to sort of give you the, the 10,000 foot overview. So the goal of the platform architecture, as I mentioned before, you know, when, um, when the wireless uh, handheld devices really took off, they took off in large part because um, of the ability of millions of creative people to develop applications. So the application development platform was a key enabler there. That's what made that field take off. And it's because none of us, not, even that amazing team that we've assembled to run this project, can't, sitting in a room, come up with all of the interesting applications that might come out of Swarm technology. We simply, we're not gonna be able to do that. I mean, try to imagine yourself five years ago and think of what fraction of uh, iPhone apps you would have anticipated. Uh, and you realize very quickly, it's almost none of them, right? What you need to do is unleash the creative minds out there by providing them with the application development platform. And so the goal of theme two is to develop that application development platform. The goal of theme three is to build services around that platform and integrate them with cloud technology. So this is where we get the benefits from being able to aggregate data from a multiplicity of sources. The goal of theme four is to deal with the fact that the designs of these swarm systems, because they're recruiting resources like 
sensors that are out there that are maybe fixed in place, maybe battery operated, may fail. They're going to be highly dynamic. Their availability is going to be dynamic. Their, their, um, your ability to use them is going to be dynamic. And consequently, any application that you develop is going to have to be in a sort of constant state of redesigning itself. So the goal of theme four is to take a lot of the design technology that I think Berkeley has pioneered over the last 20 years, but this design technology that we've been working on for 20 years is more focused on the classic design problem of where you design systems up front, then you manufacture them, then you ship them. And so the design technology is all devoted to this upfront part. The goal in the TerraSwarm project is to take much of this design technology and move it into the deployed system and use it for the evolutionary uh, growth and adaptation of these systems. So that's, that, that's what that goal is. Now, let me go back to the smart city theme. So smart cities, of course, one of the reasons we decided to focus on smart cities is that it's a broad enough problem that almost anything we do can be declared to be uh, you know, something that fits into the smart city theme. But um, one of the key ideas here is uh, what we call the tale of two cities. So to underscore what we mean by that, uh, here's a picture of Atlantic City uh, uh, just close to, just next to the boardwalk on October 28th of last year. And here's a picture of Atlantic City two days later in more or less the same spot, okay? Um, pretty transformed. Um, in the tale of two cities, our goal in applications that we develop around swarm technology is that each, each piece of architecture, each piece of technology that we developed should of course be able to provide a useful service in the best of times. It should give us improved efi energy efficiency, improved transportation, something of value, perhaps a better quality of life. In the best of times, it needs to provide a valuable service. But one of the key litmus tests that we have for any application we develop in swarm technology is that it also be able to provide value when it's severely under stress in the worst of times, when uh, a key, a large uh, parts of its networking infrastructure have disappeared, for example. Now, fortunately, um, with swarm technology, we actually have uh, considerable potential for actually building systems that are very robust in the, in the presence of severe stress. Many of the devices will be battery operated, autonomous, wired, uh, wirelessly communicating, and will survive uh, severe stress and continue to operate and continue to be able to network. So one of the key things that we want to do is each application that we developed is not gonna be just a demonstration of some cool thing we can do but we're also gonna require the team to show what it does when everything breaks down around it, okay? And how you can use it for some useful service. So let me, let me give you a concrete example. So one of the problems, one of the applications that we're working on we, we, is uh, what we call the Marauder's Map. Uh, now, if, you're, if you've read Harry Potter, uh, which I have because I have kids who have really enjoyed it and I've, been, uh, uh, I've read it with them, um, you know what the Marauder's Map is. But in case you don't, it's a map of Hogwarts Castle where uh, when you activate it with an incantation, which is I do solemnly swear that I am up to no good, then um, it shows you where everyone is in the castle. Okay, little dots appear on the map with labels next to them which give their name. Um, so we're actually developing a Marauder's Map and one of the goals here is in fact to take advantage of this multiplicity of, of uh, sensor information in order to be able to uh, you know, create this map that of course you would carry around on your tablet or on your phone uh, and be able to identify say where your friends are in the, in the environment. Now obviously there's privacy concerns here. So we have a, a flip side to this which we call the invisibility cloak Okay, now if you know Harry Potter, you'll know that this is a bit of a, uh, of a misrepresentation of Harry Potter because the invisibility cloak actually cannot hide from the Marauder's Map. That's in fact one of the, it's pretty much the only way you can see through the invisibility cloak in Harry Potter is with the Marauder's Map. But in our invisibility cloak, we would like to strike a balance. So the balance that I'd like to say here is, if an individual does not want to be identified on the map, the sensor network should respect that. Okay, but not respect it so far that say 
an, a self-driving car will run over that person because it doesn't see them, okay? So that's the balance you want, right? And you, how do you strike this balance? This is one of the key questions. How do you convey information over the network that enables that balance to be struck without violating people's privacy? So this is, these are challenging problems. One of the key insights here is that the security problem actually can be easier to solve when you have more data than when you have less data. This is a principle that we call safety in numbers. This, is a, uh, this concept has been, a, has been uh, uh, heavily exploited in, a, in an approach to privacy that people call differential privacy. And differential privacy requires having enough data that you can, in fact, uh, preserve privacy when you aggregate data from individuals with data from other individuals, okay? So it's somewhat counterintuitive, but with large amounts of data, large numbers of, large numbers of sensor feeds, if you design the system right, you can actually improve your ability to provide uh, safeguards about privacy. Now, I wanna emphasize that all of us are in fact used to being surrounded by sensors that can invade our privacy. Um, we, everybody here is used to this. You might not be overtly aware of it, but if you have neighbors, uh, next to your house. They have sensors, they have eyes and ears, and they, are, they have the potential to be able to um, spy on you, see what you're doing, to see things that you don't want. And we have decidedly low-tech ways of, of dealing with this. We build walls, we put curtains on our windows, and so on. And we also have social constructions uh, around around these that, you know, where people just simply will avert their eyes because it's just the way we do things. We have these social constructions that, that despite the fact that we're surrounded by sensors that can invade our privacy, we can nonetheless maintain an acceptable level of privacy. In the case of swarm technology, of course, we don't have the hundreds of years that we've had to develop that cultural and, low, and decidedly low-tech infrastructure uh, to preserve the privacy. And things are gonna happen much, much faster with this technology than they, of course, happened with you know, the construction of neighborhoods, uh, which is where you know, the, the older version of privacy pr uh, preservation had to be dealt with. So we're gonna have to be, we're gonna have to put in mechanisms uh, very early in the process that are going to ensure the ability to come up with essentially these social constructions such that people will be able to accept this technology. It's an, an enormous challenge. Now, um, but again, we believe that the large numbers, the, the large amount of data is going to enable this rather than be an obstacle to it. Now, large numbers can also improve robustness and reliability of systems. Uh, systems can become less brittle uh, if there are large numbers. We've, we certainly see this um, in biology. Humans have become more robust as our population has increased. You know, small isolated villages are drastically more vulnerable uh, than large communities of humans. Um, ants are another example. I learned uh, quite to my surprise um, that the um, animal biomass of ants is approximately the same as the animal biomass of humans on Earth. So the numbers are in fact very, very much larger. Um, but nonetheless, the one of the goals in, Terra in the TerraSwarm project is to leverage the large numbers of components in these systems to be able to deliver robustness. That, of course, requires a new approach to design. These systems have to be continually redesigning themselves uh, on the fly as components appear and disappear and resources appear and disappear. And a third key problem that we're addressing here is that you know, much of the technology that we're developing uh, was in fact, I mean, that we're building on was developed primarily for processing information. It wasn't developed primarily for interacting with the physical world. Computation is discrete, the physical world is not, for example. Computation is imperative, the physical world is not. The physical world is concurrent. Um, and if you build naive bridges between these two, we know from experience that they, uh, they don't work very well, okay? So the key goal is the platform that bridges the, the resources. The resources here we think of as the millions of sensor and actuator devices, the networks, the storage devices, and the computing infrastructure in the cloud. 
The applications are the things that most of us will be surprised by because when we unleash millions of creative minds, they're gonna come up with amazing ways, amazing things to do with these resources that we're not gonna be able to anticipate now. Our goal is to build that, uh, that open source, open architecture platform that unleashes those minds, hopefully something with a reasonably narrow waist so that we get as many creative minds as we can and not just the intense techno nerds um, enable the creative minds to be able to use these resources effectively. So I don't know if we have time for questions or a mechanism, but if we do, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. So thank you, Edward. We do have time for a, a couple. We have a couple of mics, but uh, in interest of time, also feel free to shout out your questions and we can repeat it here on the stage. Uh, can you say anything about where or when you're going to start your, your smart city work? So the question was, can you say where or when you're going to start smart cities? Um, so we're, because this is a nine university center, we're, we're doing this in a somewhat uh, distributed way. And we have a number of, of pieces of existing infrastructure that we're leveraging. Um, so at, uh, at, at Berkeley, we're in fact leveraging a lot of the infrastructure that David Culler here has built, um, which is uh, network has, has e effectively instrumented the campus, uh, and the, in particular the energy, uh, the energy consuming devices across campus. So we're leveraging that effort. And so we, we hope to take advantage of that. Um, at, uh, in San Diego, which is one of our partners, we're collaborating with Texas Instruments, who is one of the sponsors indirectly through this Marco program, uh, on a smart grid technology. Um, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, they, they have this uh, Sensor Andrew project where they've also put in an extensive instrumentation infrastructure in the campus, and we're gonna be leveraging that as well to build this, these smart city applications. So those are just three examples of things that we're gonna be building on and uh, you know, adding technology to and, and developing applications, but focusing really primarily on this app development platform that makes use of these resources. Okay, with that, thank you, Edward. <laughs>